All right. Okay. So it looks like most of you came back. There wasn't a huge deletion of numbers from the um, the records online, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I want you to stay, of course. I understand you have choices to make, um, but I think you'll find this to be a lot of fun, especially as we get further into the course, as we get deeper in, um, and you move away a little bit from assignments to your projects. And I'll talk about some some things you don't have to, you know, do calculations for. So there's there's good stuff coming towards the end as well. All right, but we have some uh, solid things today. We have uh, manifesto, which I monologued myself out of giving yesterday, and then we have. Uh, Scaling. So we're going to start on scaling. This is a very rich, um, beautiful area of thinking, basically. And I have a few things here. Now, if I can get this to work. So the idea here, right, is I can write on this thing with the wireless magic stuff. And yeah, so that's good. So this is, so for years I tried to concoct some sort of system where I could get a camera to connect to this and pipe it. It's madness. But anyway, so um, technology caught up. So we need a Pratchett update. I'm going to show you a Pratchett thing to start with. Cricket, obviously, if you want to talk about the cricket, we can talk about the cricket. So it looks like uh, India is thrashing Sri Lanka here. Um, very important. I do this only for my amusement. This is our ridiculous cat in the backyard. This is a rabbit that just walks straight in front of it. And the thing is, Pratchett is, uh, is there. This is like the most magical thing for a predator. And um, he's an indoor cat. We take him outside now. Look at him. What an idiot. <laughs> it's like his eyes have truly lit up. This is the greatest moment. And fail. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, yeah. It's much easier to uh, stare at people until they get food out. That's exactly what he does. You just turn around and the cat is staring at you, blink, blinking at you. Anyway, they communicate in interesting ways. Uh, Pratchett is doing well. All right, so um, thanks for asking. So we have uh, other pieces. Okay, so okay, so I, I want to mention that I am working on a book. There's madness here. This is all madness, right? So here's the scaling. This would be the scaling uh, section uh, chapter, which I've sort of started on. So um, this will be fun. And it's just a different way to communicate things. You know, I spent a long time building all this online sort of stuff. And, and now I think I'm at a point where we'll do this. And we're talking about books for happiness and, and those sorts of things. But yeah, you know, this gives me mad little uh, ways of you know writing little footnotes that amuse me basically. But uh, anyway, so this will be this will be a thing, but that's going to take a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, office hours. Okay, so now we have them, and I think they should all look. Uh, they should all be here. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so I don't know if it's updated. Okay, I have to update this. All right, so it's going to be. Let me write them down then. It's um, office hours. Okay, so they are here. They're going to be 10 to 11.30 on Wednesdays and um, 1.15, so this is starting today, to 2.30, so it's a full cycle or whatever, uh, class thing, and that's Tuesday, Thursday. So this fellow over here, David Dewhurst, is the assistant deliverator I mentioned the other day. He's going to come along, right? Most, most of these things, yeah, hang out in the corner. And... Um, Probably ask questions. <laughs> so he will help you, and um, also with projects, right? So I'm hoping that he can be a conduit for a number of you who want to work on the supercomputer and work with you know, large data sets and so on. Right. Uh, OK, so what else should we say? And I do have your notes to give out, so I'll do that probably through. Yeah. I need to add a whole other chapter. OK, all right. So here's a, a past um, tenant of Parks who's trying to um, make it easier for you guys. Right. So it's good. I uh, appreciate that greatly. All right. So we have office hours. So this, uh, the first assignment is up. That is here. Uh, bizarre gardening accident. So, uh, and I, I think I showed this to you as well. So I want you to look at these little notes here, right? So this is how you should submit it. If you're a graduate student, you should write in LaTeX, which will be interesting for some of you, but it's a good, you can talk to me about this if this is impossible and so on, but this is a good thing to do. Um, you know, these are technical documents and LaTeX is the great um, thing. So you can talk to me about that. Uh, you can email them to me. This is the idea. You'd, you'd make a PDF and email them to this address. This is a nice little feature of email addresses. I don't know, you probably know these things, but if you put a plus, this gets ignored, right? But it's a nice little way of adding a thing to your address so that it can get piped in different ways. Or you can, yeah, it's a sneaky little thing. 
So yeah, mostly mail systems will just ignore that, but it's helpful for me on the. So if you have to sign up for say 20 Twitter accounts, then you can do this, right? You can distinguish yourself and still use the same real email address. Anyway, that helps me sort them out because I have um, terrible trouble with email. Uh, this is how you should name them. This is also, this seems ridiculously silly, but this is very helpful because then they're all listed in nice ways. Um, this is a little bit of a code thing, and I know sometimes people stumble on this, but here's the example, right? So if it's, it'll be 01 for assignment 01, and then your name, right? That's, that's all it is, and that's what that, that means. Sometimes people send me exactly this, so don't do that. <laughs> The code people smiled at that. Okay, uh, and then when we get to projects, the, the, that'll be, a, what I want is once we're going with that is you send a weekly update, right? And it, it's just you build the same document and can point to some online stuff that you're doing, whatever you want, but you just build cumulatively. And if you haven't done anything for that week, you still send me the same thing, right? So, I mean, you can send me nothing, but then I'll know you've sent me nothing as well. Uh, okay, so that's, you know, we'll talk about GitHub and, and so on later on. Uh, but that's, that's sort of coming. But this will be a standard piece of stuff that's at the bottom of all of these little assignment panels so you can read it again. Uh, I think most of the assignments have a little bit of help at the start. Right. So if I recompile this, for example, the office hours will be sorted out. Okay. All right. And it tells you again what to do. Now, if you're just writing by hand, then you can scan it in some way. Scannable is a good scanner thing. Yeah? That's a... My wife's a journalist, and for some reason, at some point, she wrote about scanning things, and that was, that's her advice, scannable. Okay. Uh, okay, she also writes fantasy, so it's different. Um, okay, so that's good. All right, so that is, that is live, and that is due next Friday, a week from tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. You can ignore that, but it's just a point in time. All right. Okay, sorry. Anything you like. Anything you like. I mean, I, I use, you know, what do I use? Mac tech, right? So t tutorials? Yeah, I mean, you could probably do okay. What do you think? Overleaf? It's okay. You can just use Overleaf. Just over Overleaf. Okay, so, I mean, the four necessities of life, right? Shelter, food, Wi-Fi is, the, right, yeah. Maslow's, Maslow's Pyramid has Wi-Fi at the bottom, yeah. Yeah, I, you just, um, it's all free stuff, right? So you should, yeah. So if you have a Mac, Mac Tech is good. Mac Tech is a good thing. There'll be a terrible page for it. Um, I mean, people like, so, so you can use the what you see is what you get things. No, what am I saying? Which one? Is that the right? Yeah. You know, that, that renders it for you and, and you kind of don't need to look at the details. I mean, of course, I, I'm insanely happy with the, I mean, I'd like, there is a very nice way, there's a nice thing to working with the underlying content, which is just, you know, like if you're writing HTML or something, which is a very sort of raw version of this, but LaTeX, you're, you're writing the content and you're not looking at the, the font that it you know that will end up in. You're not worried about paragraphs. And in fact, you know when you write in LaTeX, you should write. And I have a whole blog thing I can show you about this. Um, you should write a sentence and then you put a period and then you should go boom and start a new line, right? Because that that starts to get your brain to think in terms of sentences. Like you don't try to make this pretty because if you want to move them around, which is a sort of these are chunks. So you start to operate in a different way in terms of writing, is what I'm saying. And then you have a thing, you press a button, and it makes the pretty thing over here. And you can make different kinds of pretty things, right? You can make different, you say, oh, I want it to look like, I mean, that's like this book, ridiculous book thing. You know, like I've spent a lot of time just saying, oh, you know, what if I, whatever. you know, like madness, right? Two columns, three columns, whatever you like, all sorts of bananas things. Um, but there's a, so there is a deeply beneficial aspect to, Creating. It takes, it takes, it separates the design part. Not entirely, but it separates it a long way up, yeah. And it's actually, a, you know, sometimes for focus it's good to have two things that you're working on, right? And some, a lot of people it's TV or something, but, uh, or YouTube, I guess. Uh, 
but you can kind of shift back between these two modes and it's sort of good. It depends on your focus ability. Mac tech. It's, it's going to be Mac, Mac tech. Wow. So computer scientists tend to pride themselves on having terrible web pages, right? That's, you know, if you look at a professor's page in computer science, it, they've sort of switched from a default of a gray background from 1992 to now most of them seem to be white, but I think that's forced upon them by the, by the browsers, but it's very simple. I don't know, I don't know why, I don't know why. Uh, anyway, so there you go, and it's just a big, there really ultimately is a big button that you push, there it is. Yeah? It's good. This is a good thing. Good thing to learn. Fear and loathing, maybe. Overleaf means you can just do it in a browser, right? You just, it doesn't matter what you use. Yeah. If it crashes and goes away, then you're in a lot of trouble. It's an interesting product. It's become, of course, you have to pay for it, too. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the ridiculous now with academic product, um, you know, what we do is we basically make everything, right? We, we do everything. We own the means of production. We, like, produce the final product for these journals. And then for some reason, give everything away and review for free. Anyway, all right, I'm sorry. I'm sick of it. Uh, okay, so we're back over here. We've got assignment. Uh, okay, now let's just, okay, I think that's good. And we're gonna talk about um, pieces. Okay, manifesto. So this is a short little piece just to set things up. And then we'll get to scaling, which is super fun. Okay? All right. Okay, good. Okay, pressure. good work. So, uh, yeah, the ways it work is uh, we'll have um, just a little background here on what I would call the golden, what I call the golden age of reductionism. So I am making these things up. But uh, th this is sort of, in a sense, the natural uh, project, um, way science kind of had to unfold and uh, manifesto is this piece now about where we are in terms of most sciences actually really okay so it's a nice it's a good word so so i'll come back to some other examples later on but complex is a good solid word it means something that most people are happy with right and has a nice kind of origin in folding and weaving um, network has another interesting kind of origin we'll get to that later on uh, but it does ultimately come from spiderweb but systems are bigger and more general, so complex. So this is, a, this is a, not a bad thing. So uh, there's a little piece that we often sort of have to talk about at the start that people would like to sort of distinguish between complicated and um, complex. So complicated would give you something you can completely understand, like a watch, right? So someone could fix it and make it, an old school watch, not like with actual gears and things. Uh, and to some extent, you know, old kinds of cars and airplanes, I and mean, these were complicated devices, but you could get your whole brain around one and fix one up if you were really into these sorts of things. Uh, but these, but that's, that's changed, right? So these have become, you know, no one can really understand one of these large planes anymore. And, and they often, you know, there have been a number of examples. I think Boeing produced some monstrous thing that all the batteries failed on it recently, right? I mean, they were trying to do something new and... Uh, so, because no one fully understands the whole system, right? So it's possible to have emergent disasters. Um, okay, so we'll get to this later. This is the highly optimized tolerance uh, story. We can get to the systems that are made very well, but they don't adapt, right? They can be quite good but, uh, at producing something. Um, and, and this is what I was trying to say here. Like, so the power grid is sort of this great example I mentioned the other day that it, there's a, we've been hooking up all these grids uh, across the world. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, not just you know purely functional ones, uh, and and we've made something that's pretty amazing, right? We can distribute power in great ways, and uh, now we're sort of putting in th renewables in, a, in an interesting way. So that's an interesting kind of complication to think about. It's not a steady supply, uh, but we can also have these enormous failures. And and you know the power grid, no one has a map of the whole power grid for the U.S., which is kind of ridiculous, right? And a lot of people actually work on po the Polish. Um, power grid because we have that data set and even there it's hard to actually simulate everything you'd think we should be able to simulate that but actually that's kind of difficult okay so they go fail spectacularly right and some people will talk about this too complex adaptive systems too but I'm not gonna do that actually I'm just gonna stay with complex systems because I want to include things like fluids and anything right yes Peter yeah yeah. 
And cars are the same way, right? So you could have someone who could pull a car apart and they could fix it up and they, yeah, but not, not now it's like modules and things, if things explode, who knows, right? You know, it used to be somewhat the same way with computers. You could, right, make, put them together to some extent, you know, and, and then Max kind of appeared as, Max was sort of one of the first ones where you just couldn't, you can't take it apart, right? Yeah. And then like phones, right? They're completely sealed objects, who knows? All right, so uh, this is just a little bit of, you know, people sort of, it's, it's funny how people get tied up about this. So this is, this is a while ago for, on the Wikipedia, right? So, which of course is an evolving uh, object itself. But um, it's, it's trying, so here the, the distinction we're trying to talk about complexity science. And what I want to say is complex systems are the thing, right? So they're the thing. Yes, absolutely. These exist and they have all these sort of interesting properties and there's enough um, kind of overlap in the way we analyze them and the kinds of signals and behaviors they produce that we can, you know, talk across disciplines. All right, so there's this sort of thing, pointing out there's no one great theory, which is fine. And in fact, if you go down to particle physics and you talk about grand unified theory, you know, if we had that, it still wouldn't help, right? It's not going to explain, you know, platypuses, right? It's just not going to help because that's a, a weird thing that happened. Um, you know, you can't just use that set of equations to predict DNA. That, we'll get to that much later. Um, so this is now talking about systems. So it's changed from a science to talking about the actual phenomenon, right? Which is good. Um, so, and, and distilled down here is the right thing. So interactions between parts is sort of the basic thing and how they give rise to emergent or collective behavior or emergent behavior that's different. That's, a, that's sort of the, the key thing. Uh, this is from one of these books I pointed to, right? There's no universally accepted definition. So people sort of, you know, they complain and, and so on. And, and here's Philip Ball, uh, who's this amazing writer. Um, and, you know, distilled it pretty well there, right? So uh, looking at how systems produce behaviors that aren't in their, obviously in their individual components. So this is just a definition that I'm going to give you. So it's a distributed system, many inter interrelated parts, right? And there could be, it doesn't have to be a network. Networks are you know, a big part of many, many systems, but it's not everything. Uh, and there's no centralized control, right? Or, or there's some limited degree of centralized control. There might be some. And there's emergent behavior, right? So there's, um, there's uh, some behavior of the whole that's not at all present in any of the individual parts. So, uh, you know, the degree to which we can go from the, the, the micro to the macro, you know, that's a huge challenge. And we've been able to do it with a lot of physical systems, like, you know, the, uh, everything in thermodynamics and fluid mechanics, that we can start from small things and build up stories for the large ones, which is amazing. Uh, but as we get to things like life, biology, and social phenomena and economic phenomena, we get a little more into algorithmic stuff, and that maybe limits our ability to do things. We might be able to model it quite well, but we might not be able to say, oh, here's a simple story. There are other things that might be sitting there, nonlinear relationships between these individuals. It doesn't have to be that, that way. Um, you know, feedback loops, these sort of naturally emerge in, in network structures. Um, this kind of idea that, that the systems are open, right? That there's energy flowing in and out. Uh, memory, of course, is a very important thing. That's, you know, these could be made, this, these could all just sort of manifest out of simple kinds of network structures, but making them explicit is important. This is often what we see for a lot of systems, uh, and this has come out of a lot of the network science stuff, is that there's a lot of modular hierarchical structure, right? Not perfect hierarchies at all, uh, but that's a hugely difficult problem. And I, I think I mentioned the other day, this is the, you know, this is this effort to try and find uh, communities or structures within some enormous, enormous uh, system that you, know, you can't just look at, right? You can't plot the network on a, on a wall. You can't do that for so many of these things. All right, and then this, this transition from physical mechanisms to algorithmic ones. Uh, and a lot of, in, uh, you know, a very important part of all of this, not, it's not there I suppose, is randomness, right? Randomness is a very important precursor to uh, structure. I'll come back to that. Scribble things. Complex systems, right? Lots of things, so everything is interesting. As I said, power grids, weather systems, you know, there are lots of fun little ones, ant colonies. I mean, we've seen, I mean, amongst many terrible things that happened with uh, Hurricane Harvey, right? There have been uh, videos of the fire ants 
not good guys, right? You do not want to, right? You don't want to be bitten by a fire ant, right? They're not. So they're coming up from South America and they tend to be, um, so they do this thing, if water comes in, they will join together and float around in huge clumps and survive, right? One by themselves will, will die, but somehow they, you know, evolution has produced this kind of mechanism in them that says, okay, we're gonna hook onto each other. It's very disturbing, not a good thing. And they rotate around, so sometimes they spend time underwater and they survive. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, as usual with tragedies, lots of great, beautiful stories of people saving each other, so you know, that's interesting to watch. We see that with tragedies with our hedonomina stuff, right? Bad thing happens and then you see all these attempts to help. Yeah. Okay, lots of systems. Maybe you work on some of them. All these fields are in, right? This is the point, right? All of these fields have moved to being, uh, to, to kind of acknowledging that they are talking about big systems and that they can, and the reason we didn't really talk about them was because we couldn't measure things well, right? So people were able to, um, you know, stay with these simple models. And when you have an absence of data, you have a flourishing of theory, right? You can see this, you can see this in physics. You go back in physics, I mean, people had all sorts of stories for, and even just thinking about how, uh, you know, how the solar system works and how the stars work, right? So we, we had some strange ideas about, um, uh, circular orbits that persisted for thousands of years. We're pretty happy about that, right? Uh, and you could get into a lot of trouble with the church if you talked about ellipses. So uh, that, that took a long time to sort out. Um, actually, I, I came across, I don't know how, all right, so I don't know how valid, but there's a survey that I came across the other day, was, which apparently a quarter of people in the US, it was a Gallup poll, I think, said that this, they got the sun rotating around the earth thing wrong, right? You, you had to, your question was, does the sun rotate around the earth or does the earth rotate around the sun, you know, A or B? So, but I think in Europe it was worse. It was more like a third of people got it wrong. <laughs> okay, um, so this is an effort by, uh, uh, who is this? This is again, this is uh, Brian Castelli, Castellani. So if you're interested in sort of some of the history of this, you can go, he's tried to connect everything together. So as I was trying to say before, it's complex, and complex systems, it's a good term, right? It's a good word. These are some of the other terms you go back. So, all right, systems theory is fine. Cybernetics, which is, this was really had a lot of very, very bright people trying to work on this. And this was this idea that, you know, you could control social systems and, and uh, biology. It, it, that, that's where they were going. A lot of people who understood control quite well. So Norbert Wiener, who's an incredibly famous character, uh, right, the Wiener process, uh, who's an MIT, brilliant guy. So, you know, there's all of this, but he's trying to loop everything in here, right? So artificial intelligence is here. We've got serial automata genetic algorithms. So it's an interesting thing to kind of ponder. Networks starts here. And so this is, you know, for me, this is where I kind of I came into existence. And Duncan Watts and I worked together for a long time. We'll talk about Duncan's later work later on. But he's here, Strogat. So we'll, we'll get to that later on. But this, is, this, was a, this was a point in time that made things much harder, much more um, analytically tractable, right? There was a lot of mathematical work you could do, um, but, but it, was, it was because of data. Okay, good. All right, so that's just a little bit about the, the words, I suppose, but in some history. But let's now talk about just the path of science in a brief way. So Democritus, so this is a long time ago, came up with this idea that the matter is made out of all these little distinguishable atoms, right? So just sort of, you know, as I want to do, sort of wander around and, uh, and claim this was true. And so this is where Adam comes from, right? It's a, un, uncuttable, right? You cannot cut it. So Plato wasn't happy, uh, did, said he wanted everything burned. Um, and, you know, people thought this was nuts, right? I mean, look at water, right? You're going to tell me this is all little bits that somehow make this nice wet thing? I mean, right? You think of all sorts of emergent properties just in physical systems, like wetness, right? If you have a little H2O molecule sitting there and you look at it, it's not obvious that wetness comes out of that, right? It's just, that would be hard to get to, right? Let alone, you know, tornadoes. Okay, so, uh, all right, so there's some time passes and then we start to see uh, chemists and so on who are getting towards this atomic theory. They weren't exactly saying that things were made up of small pieces, but it was starting to emerge in this way and the periodic table appears and you know, this is, a, this is a, an enormous time. But this takes about 300 years, really. Uh, and this is, to me, it's sort of, I mean, when I sort of went back and, and, and sort of discovered this, is a very surprising thing. Okay, so Boltzmann, very famous guy in physics, 
he, he believed, believed, right? He believed that atoms were underlying everything. And he, you know, from, those, from that assumption was able to derive uh, gas laws and so on. But the people around him, and he, so he was German, and his German colleagues in particular thought he was, this was nuts. You know, so Ernst Mark, right? So Mark one, Mark two. Thought they, this was bananas. And uh, around 1900, you, you could, right? So this is 1904. Most physicists seem to reject the idea that atoms existed. It's 1904, right? So we're only just, we've only just woken up, basically. Um, and he, he was stuck in a section called Applied Math at this conference, which was very disappointing. And he got very upset, and he talked about um, Darwin, and yeah, it's not happy. Um, he was actually kind of excited about Lamarck which I guess if he'd waited long enough, we'd get back to epigenetics and maybe he would be happy. Anyway, so uh, he died, you know, he, well, I mean, he, he, his end of his life was not great. He died um, tragically. Uh, so, but just a few years later, we get this, right? So, so Einstein had a pretty good year in 1905. So he has these five remarkable papers that are quite different in nature. And one of them was about Brownian motion, which we'll get to because it is a glorious, beautiful thing. Uh, and it, it's, it's a kind of a great emergence sort of story. You've got all these little things bumping around and they produce uh, Gaussian distributions, right? That's, that's a really awesome thing, actually. Uh, so, but he, this, this was a theoretical argument to kind of demonstrate that this, this observed Brownian motion, named after Brown, uh, could arise from an atomic model, right? This sort of slow movement away of stuff could, could follow from little things bouncing off each other. So it's like, well, you know, this actually could work, right? So that's 1905. And then there's an um, a experimental work that really verifies it. And everyone says, OK, atoms exist. That's really strange. It's, I think that's incredibly strange. OK, and we, so, so working out what the, the, you know, the, the smallest parts are, that takes a long time. And of course, then there's quarks and gluons and all these, you know, bananarons and crazy things that we have now. And dark matter and dark energy, which is just sort of making things up. But, um, uh, you know, atoms are a big deal, right? And we don't, we don't say, you know, we, we, we're kind of at a point, so I'll talk about nutrition a little bit because it's an interesting, you know, emergence of taste, right? And the emergence of, you know, a healthiness of a food or whatever from all these constituent parts. I mean, the way we are now is we, we have ingredients on the side, right? And I'll tell you how many carbohydrates and fats and so on. But it's broken down. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's sort of a, it doesn't say how many quarks there are, right? We, we know that that's not really important, right? Like, did you eat enough gluons this morning, right? So we, 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 we worry about zinc. It's like zinc is a thing, but we're not worried about the insides of zinc. Yeah. So as far as we're concerned, we're pretty good at uh, building off of these building blocks. Um, which is, you know, and there's a discrete number. We try to make bigger ones because we're sort of bent on destroying the universe, I suppose. But, um, uh, but you know, there's only 100 or so hanging around. Pretty amazing, right? And you have to have star. I mean, this is the Carl Sagan excitement, right? You have to have a star explode to produce anything above iron and above, right? So that's kind of amazing. So a lot of the things sitting inside you had to come from something going bang in a very, very big way. Uh, because otherwise it would never have been made. Uh, that's, that's remarkable, right? First strange. Okay, so there is a, and, and there is the big history story that uh, has been, so Bill Gates is su supportive of this, and, and in some ways we'll sort of touch, I've been touching on this for years, I suppose, but there is the sort of the arc of the universe, right? So, you know, what's the probability that it happens this way, and so on and so on and so on. Very interesting problem. Why does anything exist? It's a good question. Okay, so, Let's see. So Feynman, so Feynman, who's incredibly uh, smart guy, <laughs> to say the least, um, and you know, a Serbic, I suppose as well. But um, uh, so his, his, so here's a thing. You know, he was a big thinker, and he would certainly put his thoughts out there, and his lectures are amazing. But if he had to pass on one sentence, essentially, uh, one one statement, what would it be? And it would be this, right? That the things are made of atoms. Like this is the most. If you had to start again, right? It took us a long time to really agree about that, but just say, this is true. Okay. Okay, it's longer than that. So, right, attracting each other, and when they are um, just little just repelling and being squeezed, right, there's very strange things, very strange things. Okay. All right. Okay, so that would, that would kickstart you, at least in the, in the science world. All right. So, let's have a manifesto. So this is just one page, I had to distill this. 
So systems are everywhere, right? And they matter. I mean, you can just think about the systems you are part of, uh, if you want to, from a selfish point of view, but we're, we're all sitting in them. Um, and so much of science has to inevitably be about systems. And we had to go through these, this time of getting to the smallest parts, right? We can't discover new, there's not an atom between hydrogen and helium. There just isn't, right? We've got, we've collected those stamps. And, you know, understanding how these things fit together is, is really then the greater part of science because this is going to go on for a long, long time. And as I said, we've had this sort of 300 years of figuring things out. Uh, Subatomic particles after atoms, DNA, right? That was, a, that was a, a huge win, right, for understanding what's going on. I and mean, now we have this code story for us, which is bananas, crazy, right, crazy. Um, people, you know, this is debatable that I put this here, but we've, you know, we've more and more begin being able to understand how people behave in certain contexts and so on. And I know psychology and social psychology are going through just an enormous upheaval in terms of what's actually um, repeatable and, and that's a very important time there. Um, so understanding creating systems because we can actually of course make them and we do uh, and we can make them purposefully, we can make them accidentally. That's the greater part of science. Um, you know, and we, we're definitely in the age of making black boxes that do things for us. So we've definitely sort of slipped into, you know, and we have plenty of stories around about Skynet or something. You know, we're kind of worried, right, that it could tip in a bad direction for us. So you know, science fiction actually is usually pretty good about looking at the possible ways things can go. So this is a huge deal. Universality, and we'll come back to this. Uh, we'll touch on this again and again. So, and, and, and the example I gave the other day is fluids, right? So honey and milk and the Earth's uh, mantle and the atmosphere and the ocean. You know, these Navier-Stokes equations were all applicable, right? They all work. We don't have, you know, we change the parameters and we may have to, you know, drop some terms off and so on, but but there's sort of this one, you know, set of equations to rule them all, which is pretty amazing. That doesn't describe, you know, economics or da da da. Um, however, very strangely, there is a there was fluid-based computing that was even still being used up into the 80s to predict things like the um, economic uh, future in the UK. The I think it's called the Moniac. It's an extraordinary machine, but it would do essentially partial differential equations by moving fluids around. It's very strange. Um, <clears throat> that turned out not to be the. We could have laptops with water in them. <laughs> so, but you know, all of this stuff that we did before. I mean, obviously, lots of experiments and so on. But a lot of the thinking that came way back here is is pencil and paper stuff. Fluid mechanics is pencil and paper stuff. What's happening now and in the last. Um, since the great era of you know, the 1980s. Um, I mean, it's funny, right? I, so I'm a 1980s person, and it was very quiet in retrospect, right? There's no internet. There's no nothing, right? It's just you would go home and silence. But computers existed, and things were coming. And because of those beasts, which have become you know, better and better, and eventually will win, uh, I suppose, but they are allowing us to do this kind of the science that we need to do. And it's, it is messy, and it's hard. Um, but it enables us, you know, measurement comes from lots of different ways, but we, we're allowed to, you know, we can now store all this data in, in very easy, shareable kinds of ways. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we can simulate things. So this is a difficult business, but it's certainly done very effectively for the weather, for, you know, all sorts of um, systems that we care about, you know, how, how cities will grow, how, all, you know, we're, we're, we do all sorts of things where we're modeling based on data and uh, simple, you know, so, sort of simple projections of the world. But, you know, it's a tough business. Okay, all right. But that's where we are and it's possible. We can do these things. It's not clear what would have happened, and it, it couldn't have happened, but if we had computers first, I'm not sure what we would have come up with. But, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of the old work, of course, is, is there because of pencil and paperness. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. So that's a manifesto. That's good. Um, I'm not going to, that's just madness. I don't think I'll show you that right now. Unless you feel like you need a cleanse. Let's, um, okay, so that's just some drum to say let's do it. It's good. The shovel is there to suggest you should just get on with it and grab a shovel. That's what that's about. Okay, so that's a lot of generalness, but I want to start to try and talk about some things that are pervasive across systems. And so the first thing will be scaling. Okay. 
So we're going to talk about a bunch of pieces here. Uh, allometry, which is this idea of uh, things scaling non-linearly with respect to each other. I'll give you examples in biology, physics. Cities has become a big piece in the last 10 years. That work has been a big deal in the last 10 years. This is just one slide on money. Uh, some interesting scale, very powerful, interesting scaling in language. And technology, Moore's Law. Okay. Good. Okay, so I had these up. Yeah. All right. So, so the story is that um, there are many systems where you have lots of, so there's, there's a lot, um, there are many scales involved, and there can be temporal scales, right? It can run over lots of um, short times and long times, and then uh, many spatial scales as well. So they can cross it. And it could be that their system's composed of many components, right? So it could be an ecological system, so you have many, you have tiny organisms, you know, nematodes and then mice and all sorts of things, right? And shrews, shrews are good little guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, elephants at one end. And so they're vastly different in size. And, um, and you've got into single cell organisms, vastly different in size, vastly different in numbers, vastly different in energy usage. So we start to talk about orders of magnitude, right? So there's many orders of magnitude variation. And, we, and, and you can ask these questions about, well, you know, what sort of things vary? You know, how do things vary across these scales? And how do these systems then fit together? You know, we have scaling in, in uh, money, of course, with uh, incredible range of wealth that people have, um, or, or that countries have, or that corporations have. I mean, just some huge variation. So what does that mean? OK, so basic definitions and then some examples is what we're going to do. Um, in the next thing we'd have, uh, in the next uh, course we'd have advanced, you know, there, we'll, we'll do something. You'll definitely do, way, you'll, you'll explore some ways to, to measure power, what we're going to call power law scaling, um, but there's some extra stuff there. And then scaling in blood and river networks, right? So these beautiful fractal structures and um, what that means about uh, biology and ecology and, and in, for rivers, geomorphology. All right, okay. That's if you stay for that. Okay, so a very simple thing, and a lot of the analysis you will do in this, say, this first assignment will be just really algebra, actually. Some linear algebra, because it's awesome. But it will be just like dexterously moving some things around. Okay, so, so what, what we get to here are back of the envelope calculations, right? This is the physicists love these things. Envelopes were, it's an old technology, you probably haven't heard of it, but people used to send things in the mail. So you would, you would, there's this idea of napkins and so on, right? You'd be able to sort of doodle some stuff out, and, and that's as much, it doesn't take 10,000 pages. Okay. And we'll see some really surprising things that people have been able to figure out from just basically, you know, a few lines and some very, you know, you need some deep knowledge about some pieces, but putting some things together. Okay. All right. So we've got these two... Uh, Variables related to each other, there's some prefactor C here and this exponent. And we'll call this the scaling exponent, alpha or just an exponent. That's the, the terminology. Um, so depending on what we're looking at, right, it could be any number, but there'll be restrictions depending on what we're thinking about. Uh, for if this is a probability, for example, probability of x, and this is, this is x to the minus, you know, 2 or something like that, that will be a structure we'll come to when we think about statistical things that have scaling. But that's the next set of slides. So that would be a negative exponent. Um, okay, prefactor can matter. It can be dimensionful, right? So there can be actually, um, you know, if these are, when you have equations, equations are universal truths, right? So if this, this has to work, if these are meters, if these things are measured in meters, it doesn't, it, it, that can't matter, right? So if you use cubits or feet or smoots, um, then it will, it, the equation will stay the same, right? The side of the smoot, does anyone know what a smoot is? Yeah, so very unfortunate. And I think he's now, he became the head of, well, let me say, so this is MIT hazing for you. Um, so they got one guy who I guess was the shortest incoming freshman and they, made, they measured the bridge that goes from MIT across to Boston, which is called the Harvard Bridge, ironically. Um, and so you can see it and they mark it out and it's so many smoots plus an ear or something. I think he became head of like the standards and measurement stuff for the government. Is that right? Yeah, in a beautiful, you know, creation of someone's career. Um, I don't think hazing usually works that way. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, 
But, you, but if you type it into Google, if you say, you know, three meters in smooths, it will do it for you. Yeah. Thank you, Google. Okay, so uh, dimensions. So this is what I was trying to say. So they must uh, um, you know, match up in some way. So if this is, say, a height length and volume V, maybe we have some objects that aren't scaling what, and I'll use these words again, isometrically, right? So if it was isometric, this would be V to the one third because volume scales as L cubed normally, right? So if we had a bunch of spheres of different um, sizes and they get bigger and bigger, then, right, so the, the um, volume for a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed, right? So it's scaling as the linear dimension of the sphere uh, to the power of three. So if we inverted that, we'd expect to see a third. So but some things don't do this, and we'll see there's like nails and trees and so on for various mechanical reasons do not actually do that. So this is just a little symbol to say dimension. So this, if this is the dimension of C, this, this prefactor, then it has to be the dimension of L divided by the dimension of this V to the one quarter. And so dimension of, well, it's, this, this, is not, this is now just to say length, right? It's length, dimension of volume is L cubed. So it's L3 to the fourth. So this thing has to have a dimension built into it. There has to be some, there's something in that C. So that's a bit of a, a thing to worry about. It's a little just a bit of a side piece, but we'll come back to it. Uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful theorem, the Buckingham Pi theorem. It's not really Pi Pi. It's just, I call it Pi, but it's not Pi Pi. It's a different Pi. It just means sort of P. So we'll get to that. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but it's, it's about this idea that uh, equations can't depend on, universal truths cannot depend on uh, what you measure your um, variables in. We'll get to that. Okay, so a big deal for these things is uh, logarithms, right? So if we take this character, and if you remember your logarithms, we're going to take log base b of both sides. So log b of y, log b of this blob. Well, we get log b of c. Because we have a product, we can break them apart. So it'll be log b of x to the alpha here, log b of c. And because we have an alpha here, we can bring it down the front. This is logarithm goodness. Yes. Okay. And this turns out to be the right plan for a lot of these things. Because now, we're, if, we, if, we, if we compare, if we have a bunch of data points, for example, and we have our y's and x's, uh, then this is now a linear relationship between log, log, B, uh, log, log y and log x. So that's good. We're pretty good at measuring straight lines or you know fitting straight lines now how, of course i've said that and that but it turns out that is a hairy business as well but but it seems like we're in a in a better better game right so this actually turns out to be a lot of arguing about how you how you fit straight lines but that's okay we'll get to that so least squares is the the story and of course there's a beautiful way to do that in matrixology um, but there are other other approaches to that okay so now we've just, we'd be looking for a straight line, right? So, uh, so there's much messing around. Because logs tend to wash things out as well, people get a little carried away and they say, oh, I have a power law, you know, and that, so you, you have to be a little bit careful here, right? Very careful. Uh, so this is an important thing. I know some of you will be math people and you will think this has to be the natural log, but log base 10, this is just, we're humans. This is just where we are. It's sort of an agreed upon thing. So, um, just the way it is. Whatever you do, you must explicitly state it. So that slips out of people's uh, grasp a little bit too. But uh, it, it needs to be clear. So when we talk about orders of magnitude, we're talking about base 10. That's a, so we can communicate with other humans, such as engineers, people who use sound, for example, decibels. OK, so powers of 10. Or Carl Sagan, if he was still here. OK, so let's, let's, let's go through. A, uh, uh, as, yeah, I mean, the, the, the title is the right thing. This is a glorious, just re remarkable, surprising, beautiful example. And so gray matter volume for brains. So obviously something very bad has happened to a number of uh, animals. Um, we can talk about that. But white matter volume here, they donated themselves to science. There you go. So uh, this way, gray matter is the thinky bits, and this is the connecty bits is sort of roughly, this is my profound understanding of brains. Um, but that's sort of the story. And so, you know, this is the wiring and this is the, right, the chips over here. So how much, you know, that's a, sort of a basic question. You've got brains, you've got lots of different organisms. What's the architecture of these things? Okay, so it turns out that, you know, it, 
sort of a very simple idea of that might be, well, you could think naively that maybe these just scale linearly together, right? So you, you double the amount of thinky bits and then maybe you double the wiring, right? <laughs> I do apologize. But look at this. Uh, this is, this is, so this is, log, this is log 10 here, right? And you can, just as a sort of a matter of note, you can put, you could plot this as manifestly log 10, right? So it could be log 10 here, and then you'd have 0, 1, 2, 3. I actually like doing that, but um, that's okay. And so what have we got? We've got uh, eight orders of magnitude here, at least on the plot. I guess it goes from about here to maybe so six orders, six orders of mag magnitude there, and maybe five this way. That's a lot. And so as a rule of thumb, which I'll plot, uh, I'll show again on another slide, three orders of magnitude in both directions is good, right? Then you, if you present, a, if you show someone your plot and they see three orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude there, and you've got a nice line through it and then you do some other statistics, they'll be like, okay, that's, that's good. You're not trying to sell me something here. So, but people do. Uh, okay, so what have we got? We have all sorts of things. So shrews are very small so we've, and uh, I guess pretty easy to catch. So there are lots of shrews down here uh, and a hedgehog, poor old hedgehog. And uh, then we get up to rabbits, which maybe Pratchett didn't get that one, but, um, and then elephants and pilot whales are right out here. So this seems like, these do seem like measurable things. Another very important thing you want to measure for organisms is basal metabolic rate, and that's a coconuts thing. But, you know, how much energy do these organisms use, and then how many of them are, and, you know, uh, is this system working, right? Because all this energy is going into it. That turns out to be a very interesting, controversial, difficult thing. But anyway, you can look at this just by eye. This looks pretty good. This line through this thing. And there's a you know, uh, correlation coefficient here of 0.998. Looks really solid. There's some subtleties to it. Uh, and the fit, you know, and you can, as we've talked about, you can obtain these fits in different ways. But it's uh, this 1.23, here's alpha, right? Plus or minus 0.01. And here's our C. Or, well, or log 10 of C, I should say. So that's the exponent. So it's not one. It's not linear. It's super linear. Right? So, this, so the amount of white matter is, is growing superlinearly. Right, so what's going on? So there's more wiring, right? You have more think, you've doubled your thinking bits, but you've had to increase the wiring at a, at a faster rate. And is that, you know, and there's another question which I don't think is quite addressed here, is, is that just to sort of make it function at all, or is it because there's sort of some evolutionary gain, or, you know? But it seems like there's not a lot of variation here, right? There aren't any organisms you know, really sitting off of this with a lot more wiring or a lot less wiring. So it seems to be just part of the game. And another piece in here, because we are always get excited about ourselves, is um, people, right? We're not special in this regard. We do have pretty big ovens, relatively, for our size. Um, we're also slow and all sorts of things, but um, anyway, we're in charge. So, um, okay, so this is Jean Terry Sonofsky. Beautiful thing. This is from 2000 in Proceedings of Nat uh, um, uh, the, Nat the National Academy of Sciences, which the joke is always this is post nature and science, or probably not accepted at science. Okay, so. <laughs> and the other knock on this is it's a, it's a bit of an old, I mean, traditionally I would say old boys, but it's an old scientist club now, right? Which is, uh, you know, you're part of the team and you get your papers published in there. It's a little, little bit shady, but anyway. There are very good papers in PNAS. I mean, it's one of the top 10 journals in the world. Okay, so let's try and understand this. And this is their argument that I'll present. And so this is sort of a kind of back of the envelope thing, maybe a slightly bigger envelope, but um, this is the kind of thing you want to be able to just mess around with some, some analysis, right? So, uh, so we've got some volume, we just, right? So these are volumes, G and W. Uh, there's a cortical thickness. Um, and then a cortical surface area, right? So you've got some, there's some, um, bump, uh, some bumpiness to, your, to the brain. Uh, and then uh, there's the average length of the white matter fibers. We'll put that in, right? So they're going to be connecting things. And then there's going to be the density of the, um, the axons, right? So we've got some chunk of the brain, right? Which is like this. Feels like an eye zombie situation. Um, and so we've got uh, you know, these wires coming out and they're connecting to some other part over here, right? wherever it is. So there's some density of, of axons hitting here. And do we have a thing? And then there's a typical length of these, right? So you sort of imagine a brain has got all these wires in between it, right? Brain. 
right? Okay, so let's sort of stick some things together. So uh, the gray matter is roughly going to be, right, so this is this cortical thickness is um, T. Sorry, I'm pressing this thing, that's T here. And then there's some surface area for the whole piece, right? Right, so if we unwrapped our brain, which would be disturbing, um, <clears throat> we'd have some big slab, it's kind of unfolded it. This is your brain as a mattress, and then um, there's T here, and there's some surface area here. Right, so the whole volume, this is all going to be wrapped up and convoluted. Yeah. Um, that maybe doesn't need to be there. This is the thickness of the cortex, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will just best delete that, I think. Okay, randomness. Okay? All right, so, and then we do a few little calculations. So this is, this is the total matter of the thinky bits, right? So it's the surface area of the, of the cortex times its thickness, if we kind of think of the brain now as an unwrapped thing. And then the, the white matter volume is going to grow. So this little tilde, it's like behaves like, so we're leaving out constants, grows like, it's a very rough kind of thing. This is because you're working on an envelope. Um, so we're going to have the density of axons, the surface area, and then their length. And we're going to count, we're going to count, uh, right, so if we unwrap this, we're going to have a wire that goes from here to here. Yeah. So we're going to count each wire twice, so that's the half in there. It's not really important. Okay, so there's just a couple which sort of connect things together. And then this is sort of a statement, right? So that our brain is, I mean, roughly, this is a bit of a sketchy thing. There's some length scale for the brain, right? Which is the average distance of these wires, right? Here's your mattress or brain mattress. It's not a technical term, uh, wobbled up. And as we look across brains, the bigger brains, then they're scaling as their brain, you know, this, this volume in here is scaling as L cubed. So let's put a few things together. You can see how you can, st we want to connect G and W. And over here we have S, T, P. We can start to eliminate some pieces. Like this, this uh, density, for example, might not change as you go across organisms. Uh, the thickness will have a sneaky little piece in it. Anyway, so this is something you could do. Right, just get hold of these guys and eliminate S and L. I mean, I guess we can do it. Why not? Let's see if this works. Yeah. Okay, so let's run down. So this is going to be uh, G S T. See if you can do this. A half P S L. Yeah, I just need to write it down because I. My memory is compromised. Okay, so um, so we could use these to get rid of uh, S, for example. I'm assuming you can attack this in different ways. I'm not going to tell you there's a... When we get to the Buckingham uh, Pi theorem, there will be a very structured way of doing things. But, you know, this is just messing around. So G divided by W, right? So I'm going to divide these two. Um, that will get rid of uh, an S, right? So that's ST over a half... Tell me if this doesn't work very well, but it's a half P uh, S L, right? So we've got these guys are going to go away, right? So it's T over a half L, and then we have this piece, right? So we can turn that around. Yep, I'm just mindlessly doing things. So we can turn that around. So this is L would scale as G to a third. So we'll put these guys together, and we'll have T over a half L. The half doesn't matter. This is G to a third. Right, so we've connected these pieces. This is exactly what happens. It's a messy envelope situation. So now we've got G. Uh, I'll bring that up. There'll be, um, well, G to the 1, G to the 3rd. Scaling as, I'll just get rid of the, the half. It doesn't matter. TW. Right. So G to the 4 thirds. Scaling as T to the W. Okay, so this is kind of close. 
And this is actually a bit, so we'll rewrite it. So it's white matter, one over T, G to the four thirds. That's not quite right, right? So this is one over T, this is G to the 1.33. We had 1.23 was the observed scaling. So this is a sort of game for these things is you, you write down some things that you believe and then just mess around with them, which is basically science, I suppose. But it's, these little scaling arguments are a lot like this. It's not an exact thing that you're sort of working towards, right? Lots of little twiddly bits. Um, okay. And that's what we had here, yeah. So then there's a piece that's just introduced. I mean, and then I'm following their argument, which is that if you go back and look at um, the uh, cortices of organisms, then in fact they tend to, they do have this very weak scaling. This is a very hard thing to measure, but they get a bit thicker, right? So as you go up through, um, I mean, this could be a logarithmic growth, but if you, know, you go from a shrew up to an elephant, then the, thick, the, the cortex thickens up. Very slow scaling. And if that was, if that was true, or, you know, supposed to be true, then that's going to clean up that little, um, right, the four thirds here, this is 1.33. We're going to basically take 0.1 off, and so we get our 1.23. So it's a bit of a just so argument. Um, you know, understanding why this might be the case seems to be something that has to come from a deeper understanding of brains that's sitting there. I think the thing that's sitting, that, that's, that's clear though, is that this scaling is very strong. And, you know, the, the, this is a fair, you know, a, a, one of these sort of beautiful little arguments and, and maybe, you know, maybe it could be improved upon, but I think it's been doing pretty well for itself. It's now 17 years. Um, yeah, so, okay. If you go, this is just a little detail in here that the surface area of the cortex actually scales as g to the 0.9. So your convolutions are actually filling space, right? So that's a fractal scaling story, right? It should be more like g to the two thirds if it was just sort of linear. If, we, if, your, if your brains were just like nice little balls of, of cortex, but in fact, they're very wrinkly, right? More wrinkles the better, apparently. Uh, this is just to show you that it's a bit, you know, like you think you've got it all sorted out. Um, this is the total volume of the brain um, uh, here, I should say, total volume of the brain here, so it's G plus W. And this shows you that each separately, they scale quite well. I mean, these, these are incredibly good fits. Uh, what do we have? That the total volume is scaling as, oh, sorry, the, the gray matter, that's up here, this bit. Gray matter is... Um, scaling as, that's the exponent really is here, 0.95, and then white matter is scaling a little bit faster. But this doesn't, so this, the problem with this, if you think about it, it doesn't really, you know, so some of these parallels can't be quite right. It's okay. But if they acknowledge that, they put it in there, it's good. Trickiness, okay. So, as I said, all right, so that's it. So again, a little argument, beautiful example. Um, and you know, these, these sorts, sorts of patterns appear, appear over and over again. And, and I'll show you some more examples as we go along. Well, I'm not going to get there. Okay. 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 So, so that's what I was. That's what I was before, before, before I just want to have this down. down. Is that? Is that? that uh, I call it. I call it. Variable of good scale. How do you test for that? So that's a problem, right? So you can say, all right, well, I just sort of want to test for this part of the variable and this part. You know, do. Does my exponent change much if I census the data in a certain way? Uh, so this is a so we'll come back to that code stuff because it is great actually. But this is a but the, this Louis Bettencourt was at Santa Fe Institute now he's in Chicago. Uh, this was an inaugural uh, or the first piece by uh, him and a, a team looking at the scaling of city uh, aspects of, of, of cities. Um, with city size, not a density, but just city size. So, uh, a bit of a funny thing. So, I'm using natural logs, so it kind of makes you feel like there's more variation. Because generally speaking, for scaling, you know, you're across all sorts of physics, biology, people do use all the like, order of magnitude stuff. This is a very, this is the exponent here, 0.093. That's incredibly weak. And what this is, is walking speed. So this is a funny thing, right? So you send your graduate students out to Dublin and 
London and wherever, Atlanta, and then get them to watch people walking around and figure out how fast they're moving, roughly. So each point here is some absurd number based on observations of humans. And the idea is, the, the claim is, right, larger populations, people walk faster. But this is a very, very weak scaling, and this is really one order of magnitude here, maybe. Oh, no, no, that's not even true. So one order of magnitude is maybe um, two of these, right? So, so pretty good variation this way, but really weak variation this way. It's not even order of magnitude, right, in, 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 in the walking variable. So that one's not great, but uh, here are some other ones, and we'll, we'll come back to those. Okay, so, okay, um, yeah, so these power law things, so there's something about scale invariance, right? This is another term that we'll use, so that these objects, whatever they are, they look the same when they are rescaled, and so these brains, if we rescaled them perhaps in the right way, then they could look the same. Um, that might be true of trees, right? So you can't just sort of blow up the picture of a tree, you may have to like squeeze it in this direction to make little trees look like big trees. Uh, and we'll talk about scale invariance. But, uh, so, but these objects could be all sorts of things. So they could be shapes, like as I was talking about, but it could be time series, you know, financial time series, for example. Like you look at a little piece or a big piece. I mean, very famously, landscapes as well, you can't tell. That's why there's always a hammer there, right? Because you, you have no idea usually how big the thing is. Someone returns with a photo of you know, some sort of landscape and it could be three feet across or a mile, you know, so. There's always a human or a hammer or something for scale in those things. Um, and people forget, right? So same can be statistically the same. That's certainly true for something like time series, right? So that the wobbling that you see on a small scale is if you rescale that time and this way, then you stretch it, it may fit. And so rescaling means changing this sort of the, the, the units of measurement. All right, so there's some simple things to say about this. Uh, let's see, let's do some rescaling. So let's go back to this one. This is very simple. So we want to rescale it, right? So we're going to use, we're going to change from feet to cubits or something. So x is going to change to rx prime and y will change, well, we'll change it in a, in a way that we have thought about beforehand. So r to the alpha, we'll put that in. So if we do that, we're just going to replace things, right? So the y becomes r to the alpha y prime and the, this guy becomes just r to the x prime there. And then you just, I'll work through it. Uh, these pieces will disappear, the r to the alpha and r to the minus alpha, we're just going to come across, and we get the same shape, right? So the, the story, the same form, right? So this is blob equals c, blob alpha. And we started with blob equals c, blob alpha. So that we, we preserve it as long as we rescale, if we want to rescale x in a simple way, just multiply it by some number, then we have to, you know, multiply y by that number adjusted uh, with the exponent alpha. But it's scale, it, it is under a certain kind of transformation, scale invariant, right? So it's the same thing. Very simple observation. So you know, most things don't do this, for example. So you know, an exponential, you can't do this, right? You can't pull it out, right? So this, if we rescale this guy, we put x is our x prime, we can't draw this out and, and recover the same form, right? So scale, so another way to say this is scale, another way to, so, so many functions or forms, the scale matters. That there is a typical scale here, right? There is a typical scale. If you think about an exponential distribution, probability distribution, then there's a typical size of things. We'll, we'll get back to that um, for um, power law size distributions. That's next though. Okay, so we, we talk about this being a characteristic scale, for example, for, um, for a, a an exponential because, and we're saying x goes from zero to infinity. So for x around about one over lambda, right, then this is e to the minus one. For x much bigger than that, this gets to be, would, gets to be towards zero. And as, as uh, x goes to, to zero, then it's, it becomes a, a constant, right? So another way of saying this is so x is much greater than one over lambda, y is small. And this is just very, you know, very roughly saying these things. So here's this rescaling story for trees. And the term here is allometry, right? So isometry just means that we just blow the picture up just as you would on a phone or whatever, right? You just go, whoop, and it just does it isometrically. Um, but allometry means we have to rescale um, in, a, in a specific way along different dimensions. 
So this is a term, it actually was introduced to think, uh, think about the way different parts of bodies will grow. Uh, we'll get to that later too. And it's Huxley and Tessier in Nature 1936, trying to sort of sort out what we should call this. But it, it's, it's become a standard term. And so you'll see allometry starting in biology, but allometry is the term you'll use for cities as well, right? So it's a, it's a general, general term. So allometric scaling is used to say something interesting is going on, basically. And this is, this is Julian Huxley, I think, right? So this should be, let me get that right. Yeah, interesting. So bad. Okay. Um, incredible to me. Um, interesting. All right. Same measure, other measure. Yes? Okay. So, um, we'll out, you know, it's used very broadly. It can be where you have a dependent variable um, and an independent variable, or it could be that you have two correlated measures, right? There's not clearly one that's dependent, or, or say limb size or something like that. Limb length, for example. Okay, good. Yeah. Ten more minutes. Okay. So, um, this is an old book now. It's uh, one of these uh, Scientific American uh, sort of coffee table books, actually. And they were they're beautiful things. I have a copy if you want to look at it. But you'd, you'd set it there, and it's, it has equations and things like that, and beautiful pictures. Um, but McMahon and Bonner. So this is a, just a, a, a piece just in general about what happens as you go across um, different scales for organism what, and what that means. So these are just a few excerpts. Uh, and again, this is to talk a, a little bit about the size of things, right? So, you know, here's the biggest tree, right? The sequoia up to 100 meters. And then there's, you know, some nice uh, science between, behind figuring out the tallest possible tree and the largest possible whale. Actually, this guy, a guy we know, Clausette, has a story for why the whales can only be as big as blue whales. But anyway, um, this has always been disappointing for the dinosaur people that blue whales are bigger than all dinosaurs. But these are, these are examples of the biggest things, right? So, and, and all to scale, right? So sheep, excellent animal. Um, I think this is a lion's mane uh, jellyfish, which is a terrifying thing that lives under the Arctic, I believe, which is wrong. It's sort of a Jules Verne bad situation. Uh, this should be the, that's the moa, which the New Zealanders uh, helped get rid of. And that should be the, um, the mammoth bird, I think, which was on Madagascar, maybe. Maybe it's the ostrich. Well, it has the largest egg. That's what I was talking about. This is a very disappointing thing, which is the largest snake. <sighs> Dread fear of poisonous snakes, which are all snakes in Australia, I have to say. Okay, so, you know, these, and then these are sort of medium sized things. I mean, just to sort of illustrate how big, you know, these are things you can see. Obviously, dogs you can see. Um, but there's the largest egg, and that's from the mammoth bird. Yeah which we got rid of. Uh, yes, truthiest birds have some strange things going on. I think the kiwi, the egg is about a third the size of the bird when it's um, produced, which is remarkable. Um, and then we start to get into smaller pieces, right? So things that you can, I think you can still see these with your eye, and then you go down and down and down, right? And so you know, one thing is, well, what are these things made out of? Right? We're talking about systems, so we're made out of cells. So sort of an interesting question is, how does a cell know it's inside an elephant or a mouse? Because mammalian cells are, you know, we've, we're very strange Lego kits, right? And, the, and those, you know, those, those cells seem to be sort of similar, uh, right? But um, there, there are things to do. Okay, but all right. So this, this is 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the 8. This is in grams. So that's unbelievable, right? So that's... You know, 21 orders of magnitude in terms of mass. Um, so that gives you some sense of, so that's life's variation, which is remarkable. And then number of cell types, right? So we have single cell organisms, and then out to whales where we, where we really only get to about 100. So that's kind of impressive. And in fact, that's something we'll come to at the end of these slides is, um, it seems that synthetic systems tend to have a lot more components, like things that we make, right? Whereas biological ones are, reuse lots of things and they're quite clever in that way or you know it's just sort of the result of 
And actually, you can see, I mentioned Legos, you can see Lego kits. Lego kits used to be more biological in that they had lots of sort of pieces that you know, were just repeated and you had to make the thing. And then they sort of evolved towards having very specific things so that they just fit it together. Um, <laughs> make it easier, I guess. Uh, yeah, so this is, you know, is there a scaling for this? That's kind of an interesting problem. Um, you know, how we grow, how, how so this just shows you how terrifying babies can be. Um, and how we're fine when they're small, right? Very cute and we'll look after you. But if you somehow walked in the door and you were six foot tall, that would be very distressing. So, um, and of course we have the big head thing going on. But this, this, this shows you some allometry in the way um, humans get it together. Uh, it's true for other organisms. So people, of course, thought about this and measured these things. And so this is, for example, body height and arm length. And so you see different scaling, right? So early on, um, the scaling is 1.2, right? So the scaling is growing faster. And then, then, then linear is, again, on a log-log plot. And then the scaling here is more like 1, right? So um, yes, this is, what am I saying there? Yeah. So, right, so then there's this break in scaling. So this is a very typical thing you'll see too, is a break in scaling, right? And there's some story for why um, the scaling changes at a particular point. And so we would talk, call that a crossover in scaling. Still two good regions of scaling. It's not a big variation, but you know, this sort of has an explicable story. So it's a break in scaling. Um, this is a funny thing. So you, I'll give you a problem actually to work on for this. So this is log body weight. This is log of the world record weight lifted. Um, and I think this is you know, some combination of things, right? So the snatches and so on, right? Is it just a snatch? <laughs> OK. Um, which is still a thing? Which is the one they stopped? Didn't they stop doing one of those? That's gone. Because you'd push it, you'd push it up. It became very silly. Yeah, right. I mean, it was silly. It became very silly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this is a pretty good scaling, and this scaling looks like actually uh, a two-thirds power. Yeah, it's up the top. This is more like a two-thirds power, right? So you're increasing, so, so weight, right? So weight is like volume, right? We sort of think density of these individuals is not going to vary too much. So weight and volume, so that's a sort of a cube of length. So a two-thirds power of this is more like a surface area scaling, right? So the argument here is that it's, a surface, but it's the cross section of the these individuals, right? But they're getting bigger, but their cross section is as they get bigger, their cross section grows with their weight as a power of two thirds, and that seems to connect with the maximum weight. What's that? These should be the. I think that's the um, body weight of the actual right. So, so it's a bit funny, right? Because this is in log, this must be kilograms, but that's, that's not right, is it? Because that would be 100 there. Hmm, hmm. We'll look it up. Doesn't seem right. It seems like a pounds, but it seems like they, if, they, if they've done that, that's weird. Hmm. Is this just a weird, this is not the right log? Is that what it is? All right, we'll look it up. That's good. Logs. Hmm. Yeah, because they've done this on this now. I've forgotten what they were trying to get to here. But if you look at this, you'll see that this one is doing a little bit better, right? <laughs> According to the fit. So we'll see a similar thing for cities. So you can look at crime rates. And then you can look at which you can look at the residuals, which is how far away you are from the best fit, and you can look at which cities are above or below, right? So it's a way of say comparing New York City to Burlington, because you say, you know, you don't just scale up. You, know, you look at how how say crime rate typically grows across many many cities, and you don't just simply say, I have a city that's twice as big, I expect twice as much crime, because you start to say. Okay, well, it actually does sort of seem to scale superlinearly. Like, that is a thing. And then you can say, oh, there's, there's variation around it. You know, which cities are doing better or worse as a function of their size? That would be an interesting plot. 
right? Crazy things, okay? So this is like horn size, for example, right? As a function of um, length of skull. Very, and you know, again, it's sort of a, a funny little argument, sort of power of four. Um, these are mechanical ones. This is something I would teach more, more in the next semester, and I'll stop in a second. This is the a shrewd, these are little things, right? Two or three grams, something like that. They're not big. And then you're getting up to thousands of kilograms for the elephant. This is the elephant shrew, which is not sure what it's doing. Um, but this is a profound, uh, well, I think it is. But I mean, it's been something that we've argued about for hundreds, over 150 years now, scientists in general. It's the basal, basal metabolic rate. So you're sitting there resting, how much energy do you use? Just sitting down. There's also how fast can you go? Um, and that's a great thing. I have to add that. That's super interesting. I have that, uh, well, sorry. That's in these slides, but then there's a really cool thing about that too. Um, max speed. So the simple argument is you might think, I'll just finish with this, but you might think, um, what things? Yeah. Okay, so you might think uh, this is two thirds. And the reason for that is if you're just sitting there, you're losing heat. This is why people can find you in the night. I hope this, you know, with the infrared thing, so at least they do on TV, right, with the, you know, where the warm bodies are sort of thing. It's because we get off heat, right, black body radiation. And um, so there's a heat loss that's happening all the time. We also, as humans, we perspire and, and so on. And different organisms lose, you know, if they're working hard, they'll lose heat in different ways. But if you're just sitting down, you're losing heat to the environment. Um, so you might think that's a surface area thing. Surface area will scale as volume to the two thirds. This two thirds thing again. So you might think, you know, mass volume two thirds. That should be the thing because you kind of have to balance that loss just to hang out. I mean, it's kind of remarkable how little wattage our brains run on, like 20 to 30 watts, which is nuts, right? That's a very dim light bulb. Like literally, we are dim light bulbs, um, and um, you know, we. We make supercomputers beat us at Go, but they are just giant machines. So, uh, okay. So it turns out that people have started to think, maybe in the 20s and 30s, that that exponent was three quarters, and so this became this great enigma. Um, anyway, so this is sort of a joke version, but um, it turns out that this is not really true, and it's too. Th this is a very messy business. We'll, we can come back to that. If you like, if you're interested in biology and ecology, I'll talk to you about it. Um, all right, one last piece and then we'll go on because it sort of finishes biology actually, I think. Oh, I want to show you that. This is the number of species on islands as a function of island size. Very messy data, but the claim is that it grows slowly as area to the quarter. And if you're in land and you take chunks of land, it's area to the eighth. Very strange. Um, one more, this is, this, let me finish with this because this is really remarkable. Um, this is stem cell divisions in lifetime. This is lifetime risk of cancer. And so we have different things here. So there's lung for non-smokers and then lung for smokers, right? So, you know, risk does go up. And this is, you know, uh, that's two orders of magnitude here. But there is a scaling here, which actually isn't part of this paper. This was in science. They don't really talk about it. But there's kind of a clear scaling. And the story is, you know, the faster you turn over, the more of a chance of things messing up, right? It's like your error in the code, basically, right? Things go wrong. Uh, you know, the, the bad takeaway from this was it's just luck, right? Except, you know, obviously if you do things that affect you like smoking, then we know that. But, but there was a, there's, there, this was sort of pointing out there's a fair amount of bad luck because these things are just turning over. The ones that turn over the most tend to kind of have a, have a higher chance long term. But this is sitting here as an unsolved problem, I think, in terms of scaling because, yes. For these things? There are all sorts of things, actually. There are all sorts of things. Golden ratios appear in beautiful ways, for sure, and a lot of natural things. But um, exponents, well, we'll see. We'll see some origins of exponents. We'll see some origins of exponents. Yeah. Yeah. There are some like that. But yeah, yeah. No, there, there are all sorts of weird reasons for them to be around. But there's a big general story of scaling, which is what we're starting on. I may push the assignment back because I talk too much. Um, you know, this is just a, just a little bit of an, an introduction to it. We'll, more examples, and then we'll get into parallel size distributions, which is something no one understands very well. Okay, all right, thank you.